Austin. Right, good afternoon. So welcome to this month's Cape Advanced Technology Lecture. I'm Da Ping Chu, I'm the director of Cape. Today, it is a great pleasure. We have Professor Carol Oyang Pella joining us. And he is the chairman and the co-founder of Silo AI and also a professor of practice intelligent platforms at uh, Aalto University in Finland. And the Professor Taro Oyampela is a global technology business and innovation leader. He has a versatile abilities and background at the intersection of technology, business, and creativity. He's the chairman and the co-founder of Silo AI, the largest private AI lab in the Nordics. And he's also professor of practice, intelligent platforms at Otto University, Finland. Taylor is an author of a platform strategy, transform your business with AI, platforms and human intelligence. Previously, he was Nokia's CTO and the chief strategy officer and served on the Nokia executive board. Taro served as the chairman of Fin Traffic, a state-owned traffic control and management company, and Bettler, a pioneer material technology company fighting climate change. He also serves as a member of the board of OP Financial Group, the largest retail bank in Finland, and also the Silly Solution PLC. I hope I spelled that name right. That's fine. Taylor was nominated as a young global leader of World Economic Forum in 2006. He has been recognized as the seventh most important creative people in business in 2009 and by Fast Company. In his spare time, he enjoyed Olympic weightlifting, boat triathlon, and skiing. So a lot of things he has done. And I think the list is too long. So without the delay, and may I introduce the title of the, today's lecture is called the Platform Strategy, How to Win with Platforms. Professor Oyan Beck. Thank you. And, and welcome also on my behalf and thank, thank you for this opportunity to speak on this guest lecture. I will share my screen. Uh, yeah, it so comes through. Uh, great. So today uh, I'm going to speak about platform strategy and how to win with platforms. And it kind of starts with uh, uh, looking in the key trends that are driving the digital transformation and platform economy in the world. That if you think about that, what has happened in the last 10, 15 years that we are seeing that the that you have computing everywhere, basically a flexible energy efficient distributed computing on demand is, is, is not only on the cloud, but is it also moving on the edge? And uh, with 5G, you can connect, uh, you have a low latency connectivity for all types of devices and sensors. You have data that is produced by tiny and inexpensive sensors from all over the place, from different machines, etc., And then AI is everywhere. So AI machine learning is widely adapted in all industry and organization. And these trends are continuing, that we are seeing that they form the basis for digital transformation, that you are able to change the business model of your company and take advantage of, of these new trends. Uh, I love my Tesla, and it's nice to spin it around in, the, in Lapland in the snow. But why is this important for platforms? It's because every kilometer 
or mile that you drive with Tesla, it collects data and uh, will send that into the Tesla headquarters where it is used to train the self-driving algorithms to become better and better. And uh, those trained algorithms are then updated over the air to the whole fleet of the, of the Teslas around the world. And the more Teslas there are, the more data they will collect, the more different situations they encounter. And in this way, it is continuously improving the capabilities. So you are seeing network effect in practice. Uh, that is every user of the platform is producing value for the other users through this data that they are producing and that is used to train the algorithms. Uh, you are actually experiencing with this the first uh, winning trade of the intelligent platforms. An intelligent platform is a, a three characteristics uh, that you can recognize it from. First is this network effect, that the value of the platform is increasing uh, with, the value, with the number of the users uh, and every user that joins the platform will also create value for other users. Like Facebook, it wouldn't be anything without an, an other users in addition to yourself. Or like if you think about that simple thing is as book store, Amazon bookstore or, or e-commerce store, when you leave a review, you are also adding value to the other users and it is strengthening the network effect. The second one is the AI powered learning loop that if you look at the Tesla, it is continuously learning faster than the other car manufacturers because it can collect more data and it can train its algorithms and it can update and improve the the performance of the car, not only the driving capabilities, but also all the other processes that are important for cars. And then the human intelligence is related to the uh, fact that uh, best platforms are not uh, bound by the sector specific strategy. Like Tesla, it is not a car company. It is a distributed platform company. Uh, because it has already moved beyond cars into the home energy storage systems. You can buy Tesla power wall or Tesla solar roof, and it is leveraging the capabilities it's created for its car platform. That is the battery uh, skills and capabilities, uh, AI and analytics, and then design. And the best platforms, intelligent platforms, are thinking the strategy that they are transcending industry boundaries. They are moving beyond their original segment. And that's, that's actually that why the incumbents are facing a competition from the left field. Uh, John Deere uh, might be familiar as a green tractor, but it is actually a, a, a intelligent platform as well. Not maybe this specific tractor that I have in the picture, but. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, John Deere equipment, tractors and other equipment are also collecting data. And already like uh, 10, 15 years ago, John Deere realized that the data that this uh, uh, equipment produces need to, be, uh, uh, need to be connected to the cloud where it can be shared with the third party uh, developers and they can develop applications based on this, um, this data. So uh, John Deere is actually uh, also uh, manifesting these winning trades. It has a network effect because the more data it produces from this equipment, the more interesting it will become to third party application developers that are developing application, for example, improving productivity for uh, farmers. The more the farmers will be interested about using these uh, applications and in this way, it has created a, 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 a virtuous circle where more data means more developers, mean more users, means better um, uh, results from their farms, increasing productivity, which in case again drives the sales of the equipment that produces more data. And John Deere is using AI to predict, for example, crop prices, crop yields, and other things, and then. Uh, with its uh, insight from this data, it is then expanding into new areas and it has changed its business model for selling e equipment into selling services um, and data. So 
when we think about the, this new approach to strategy, I think I used the Zoom that we are using in this specific lecture as an example that uh, how do you actually uh, execute this strategy? Uh, you start with the very focused offering, like Zoom uh, was conquering the, the market with the, with the specific offering. It will then uh, all the time try to push it and, 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 uh, and uh, amplify the network effect, as I described, and be the best in the category. And Zoom has outperformed its competitors. But it has also used the insight from the market that Zoom can be also used for other purposes than just uh, uh, connecting enterprise users. For example, it, there is a need for doctors to connect with patients. And that requires that you fulfill a specific standards that are um, typical for healthcare industry. And Zoom recently created a specific offering for healthcare in industry for communication. So you are actually moving into the new segment and it continues to expand with, with this. And, and there it is uh, then uh, connecting with the new partners and using AI to learn from the use cases and this way accelerating its learning capabilities that how are the users using their platform, what capabilities could they add, what new segments could they conquer. Uh, so Zoom is not limited to the original use case, but it's continuously thinking about how to leverage their, their platform uh, beyond the uh, initial start. So this is kind of the, the how part of that, that you start focused and then you expand from there. And I will come back to this uh, specific team. Uh, when you start to uh, look at that, what is actually differentiating these successful companies from others, you quite quickly notice that they are focusing on minimizing transaction cost and designing what I call a frictionless experiences. How can you reduce friction in, 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 the, in the world? And there are at least three types of transaction costs that you can think about. There is a search and effort cost. That if you need to find something, maybe a spare part for your factory, or you can need to find a, a car to uh, taxi to, to, to take a ride, or you need to find uh, uh, something from the e-commerce. There you can, of course, through the marketplace mechanism and intelligent matchmaking, you can consolidate the demand and supply, and in this way reduce the, the effort uh, that is required to, to, to get to the service or product that you need. So wherever you can reduce the search and effort cost, uh, that will be good, and there are different mechanisms for, for that. Uh, then the other cost that we might not always recognize, but uncertainty and anxiety is actually consuming, consuming quite a lot our time and, and, and it costs uh, real money in the end. We are worried about whether the taxi will arrive. We are worried about whether the spare part that we ordered for our, our uh, uh, a factory will arrive in time. We are worried about whether we will get the food in time because we are hurry for a lecture. So whatever you can do to reduce this uh, uncertainty and anxiety by, for example, real-time tracking of things and visualizing it to users, uh, that will be a recipe for success. And then uh, when we have been delivered a product or service, we are worried about whether somebody took advantage of us whether there was opp opportunism in the in the executing the the service, and and the, that you can reduce by actually providing a transparency, whether it is as simple thing as customer ratings in the uh, Upwork that if you order uh, something that uh, uh, some some service for example that prepare this slide set to the to the study, the Upwork will actually first of all it will track. All the, uh, all the work that you will do so that the customer can review it afterwards. And you can then provide also feedback one to five stars. And in this way, uh, increase the uh, uh, trust into the platform and specific service provider. So there are specific mechanisms that uh, successful platforms use that are quite common when you look at that, how are they designing their frictionless experiences and minimizing transaction costs? 
if you look at more specifically into the into the uh, how to reduce the search and effort cost i already mentioned a couple of techniques for example creating the intelligent matchmaking how do you can actually uh, match two parties together what parties do you need also other why do they need each other and what parameters to use to make an ideal match of course upwork that matches freelancers with uh, with individual customers or corporates it's quite different from tinder where you match uh, uh, humans for for a date so you need to always think about that what parameters to use to make an ideal match but more and more we are seeing that the intelligent matchmaking is moving to new areas especially in the b2b world you can consolidate with the marketplace approach to demand and supply for example tetra pack that uh, is a uh, many uh, provides uh, factories around the world around 5000 food and beverage uh, packaging uh, uh, factories they recently introduced a b2b marketplace for uh, spare parts in order to consolidate the fragmented supply side to make it easier for the customers to to buy these spare parts and the benefit for tetra pack is that it collects all the data and can improve the service or you can uh, leverage unused assets and reduce the need for capital for a customer. For example, these um, e-scooters wouldn't have taken up so fast if they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't provide it as a service rather than you would need to buy the, the e-scooter. So the business model was, spent, uh, was based on the, on the renting in, instead of owning, and it was made very easy with the, with the platform that they have built or you can use technology to automate and smoothen the experience. I will come back to the uh, power tool manufacturer Hilti that has moved from the manufacturer into providing service where they track every uh, tool with the RFID and use uh, AI to predict the usage of the tools. And in this way, uh, helping their customers to, to improve the usage and reduce downtime of the specific tools in a, in a big uh, construction sites. Uh, so those those are you start with reducing the the, the friction, but when you get started uh, with uh, building your platform, you should think about focus, and only through focus you can create the enthusiastic users that I call here fans. Tesla is a great example. It didn't it didn't start with the ten cars. It started with one car. Uh, very uh, uh, well branded for the high-end customers that were environmentally conscious. Or you can think about the uh, example of the uh, iPhone that it, it didn't start with 10 phones like Nokia in the past, but it started with one phone and, and uh, built from there. In a similar way, I can see that now Volkswagen, Mercedes, etc., a number of companies are, are struggling because they have so many cars where to start really to build the fantastic experience uh, that has served so well Tesla. It's hard for an incumbent, but for a newcomer, it's easier to start focused. And Tesla uh, created uh, uh, experience where they uh, had one car, built uh, the service there. Uh, they also uh, created a new way to market the cars because why did Tesla actually put their their um, showrooms into malls because everybody who goes there will take a selfie of the tesla in the mall and and provide marketing for them so when you think about the technical uh, platforms you always need to think about not only the, the product and the service but also the way how you go to market and create the pool uh, for customers that will strengthen the network effect for you for your platform and it, this does not only apply for consumer products, but also for, for B2B. And we are seeing more and more of the B2C practices moving into B2B. Uh, also in the case of the, uh, uh, on Tesla, we can see that they are leveraging uh, communities in a nice way. There are a couple of uh, screenshots from the Tesla uh, discussion boards from Facebook where there is a constant discussion from the, their customers about the uh, uh, self-driving capabilities of Tesla. 
anybody who has driven Tesla knows that it is not perfect. For example, I drive to Helsinki uh, every week at least, if not every day. And, and sometimes I have been driving under a certain bridge 10 times and uh, 11 times I go there, it suddenly break, breaks for obvious, no, no obvious reason. And it might even cause a dangerous situation. I, I will be frustrated and angry, but many users will go online and they went their anger and frustration to other users who will explain that, hey, this is a nonlinear system. Uh, uh, AI is like, a, like a, a teenager. It's always and constantly learning new things. And sometimes it makes mistakes, even the, it, it knew it perfectly earlier. And this helps actually the Tesla users to forgive the mistakes of the platform. If you think about this technique, you could apply it also into, into other uh, services and products where you use the community to, to help you to gain fans. Uh, the fans will explain things to the other users and this way you, you further strengthen the network effect. And uh, when, when, when you look at the, the best companies, like for example, another great brand is a Peloton that provides this high-end uh, uh, spinning bikes and uh, uh, lectures that you can take either in their studios or at your home. They are continuously monitoring uh, through their data and analytics that how are users using, what features that they use, and in this way, uh, increasing the, the engagement and uh, building uh, their community further. And, and also, when you, when you think about this, uh, these services, they always have a feature that you can very easily invite new users. And this does not only apply to brands like Peloton and Tesla, but also like Slack that, for example, enabled uh, a very easy take on of the service. If you had a certain specific email address uh, uh, for a company, so you could share with the other, other company members that, and in this way, uh, it was driving the Slack usage up um, when they started. So uh, if we summarize that what we have discussed so far is that we have the three winning characteristics of platform, network effect, AI learning loop, and human intelligence constantly expanding to new areas. You start by removing friction, uh, focus on simplifying the life of the users, whether they are uh, uh, consumers or business users, and then uh, you focus don't build a platform from the beginning, but start with the great service and expand from there. And uh, here we can see a, a, a great example of the, uh, let's call it the unconventional uh, platform. This is a Hilti. Hilti is uh, known for this red uh, power tools. Maybe the Hilti nail gun is the most uh, known uh, tool from this company. They started as a, a product company. They were selling these tools to customers. Already around 2000, they moved to new business model. They were leasing these tools and then provided the maintenance and management of the tools as a service for their customers. But uh, things are getting now more interesting where they are also now, as I mentioned already earlier, that the, every tool is uh, provided with RFID sensor. Uh, which uh, tracks the usage of the tool. And this tool data is used by AI to forecast, for example, the tool usage. Uh, they are also blending the, the uh, physical world with the virtual world that, for example, their uh, drilling machine that is now a robot is driven by the, what we call a building information model, which is a millimeter accurate uh, uh, model of the of the real building and it can be used now to uh, steer the robot to drill for example holes into the uh, walls or roof and in this way uh, they can design uh, the thing in the in the virtual world and then then uh, drive the the real work in the construction side so hilti is a great example that you have moved from the being a product company into a company, a platform that improves the productivity of their customers, in this case, the, uh, the, the building companies that are constructing various uh, buildings and, and, and larger infrastructure. 
but uh, here here is a really a thing that I love about Hill that it's really going beyond uh, extreme to improve the, the platform. Uh, you can see here a spot uh, robot that is uh, manufactured by uh, Boston Dynamics. And uh, this spot robot is wandering around automatically, autonomously uh, in the building side. And it is uh, all the time uh, looking around with its camera and taking photos and video. So it is collecting data. In the first phase, it is documenting what is happening in the site. And, and in the next phase, the computer vision is used to analyze this con uh, what, is, what is going on there. And it's, it can spot mistakes uh, as they collect more and more data. And maybe in the future, uh, the spot robot will come to a building uh, a person that is uh, doing something there and knock on your shoulder and says that, hey, you made a mistake here, let's correct it together. And, 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 and if that's, if it, whether that is the vision or whether the, it will be uh, robots correcting the, uh, the building, we will see. But again, we can see that the spot robot here is a, a sensor that is collecting data that is used to teach AI. Because first, of course, it might not know that much, but you have examples of the mistakes that are typically made in the construction side. You can use that uh, those examples, the labeled data, to teach the AI uh, the, the, the mistakes that are typically made. And when the spot robot makes a video of the site, it can be analyzed and uh, the mistakes are identified. And of course, it, it, it creates an archive uh, uh, that can be then uh, checked afterwards. So great example how you are moving into new direction as a company that started from this uh, as a product business with these nail guns. With AI, so uh, where should you start with AI when you are building your platform? The key is to understand that what are your business goals and to understand AI capabilities and, and get started because AI is not the magic thing that you drop from the through the roof and it will uh, uh, do miracles. But you need to really think about it as a, as a baby that you start to teach things and you will, learn, uh, and you will learn fast and it improves all the time. But you start with the business goals. What can you do to transform your company to really uh, create, do something different than the competition? And here we have an example of the interesting company called Orica. It's an Australian explosive uh, manufacturer that uh, noticed that uh, its uh, uh, blast engineers are advising customers around the world where they are uh, doing uh, designing blast uh, fields. So if you need to blast a, a rock, for example, in a mine, you need to, uh, to build a blast field that uh, will, will have different type of the explosive and the design can be then in this case, uh, teach to AI. So they built a machine learning model to, uh, that can, can do the blast design and they started to use it. So every time a blast is done around the world, the data is collected and it will improve the AI in their platform. So again, you can see that there is a network effect in, in place that every new customer will provide new data that improves the platform for other uh, uh, customers as well. AI used to teach and uh, then Orica can expand the service to, to cover also other parts of the process than just the, just the blast. So start with the business goals and what, what, uh, what can you do to transform? So Orica is transforming from a explosive manufacturer into a uh, intelligent platform that helps their customers to do better job in their in in their uh, respective sites. Uh, AI cannot do everything. I, we had a case in Silo that we work with the Finnish uh, airline Finnair that operates uh, mainly in Europe and Asia, where the problem was the flight delays. That how can you predict? flight delays, uh, and then uh, decide what to do after it happens. And first, the Finnair team 
thought that the AI can do all the decisions that reroute the customers, uh, reschedule the, the flights, etc. But of course, that's impossible for the dumb AI. It needs to start from a simpler task. And in this case, the simpler task was to predict flight delay 36 hours in advance. Uh, and, uh, and based on that, then the human can make a better decisions. And the uh, and, uh, question about uh, for companies is that when you start to use AI, that how can you identify the key processes where to start? And uh, will it help you to actually improve the, the processes? And is it meaningful enough and, and significant enough? And then you start to expand from there. And the question is not that much that what was the first step, but how can you accelerate and learn faster than the competition, like Tesla is doing, the Orica is doing, etc. Here are some um, use cases that uh, we uh, as a silo AI, silo is around 200 person uh, expert company that works with clients and, and, and helping them to build AI systems for their businesses. So the message in this slide is only that the AI can almost apply to any problem that where you have data, whether it is uh, uh, cancer diagnostics that we, we work with uh, uh, Philips to identify the uh, cancer uh, sort of the cells and then target the, uh, the treatment better, uh, whether it is a visual anomaly detection or visual quality control in a factory where you are with camera uh, uh, checking the quality and AI is constantly improving the, the, the quality system or, or whether it is a predictive air, aircraft maintenance where you are collecting data from, a, for example, from the motors of the aircraft and, and predicting in advance that when things will start to break down and you need to, you need to take a break and, and make a service or whether it is a, with postal service uh, predict the parcel arrival uh, in order to sort of to give better information for customers when they should be available. So you have a lot of problems where AI applies and the question is not that much about the technology but it's just really about understanding your drivers from the business side and then and then applying the right techniques and, and build this uh, what I call a learning loop. How can you learn faster than the others and all the time expand your learning capability? And, and bring more customers that produce more data and you can in this way improve your platform. Uh, here is an interesting company that uh, if we look at what we have now done that we have looked at how to remove the friction, how to get started focused, how can you use AI to, uh, to, to make your platform more intelligent. Then the question is that what is the, the, the best way to leverage partners in this process because platforms need partners. This is a elevator company, Kone, that is the one of the largest. Uh, there are two uh, made main elevator companies in the world. One is Kone. Uh, the selfie is here uh, taken with the service delivery, uh, with the delivery robot. Uh, why is that related to Kone? Because Kone has opened up their uh, APIs uh, for uh, third parties, in this case for delivery robot that can call an elevator in a high rise building, move autonomously there and deliver goods to, for example, hotel rooms, which is of course highly desired capability in the era of COVID. People don't want to actually be delivered goods with human touch, but by autonomous robots. In a similar way, Kone work with the blind square that is an application that uh, a blind person can wear, wear uh, and hear all the time that, uh, that uh, move right, there is an obstacle. So there is a database that it is reading. And in this case, it can read the, uh, the escalator direction so that it can say, for example, that in front of you, there are escalators. Uh, the left one is going up, the right one is going down. So, so you know where to go as a, even though you cannot see. And this is, of course, this call and information is delivered through an API, application programming interface, an electronic interface that enables companies and, and or software to communicate with, with other software. But even though API is a very technical construct, uh, you should think about it more from the uh, uh, 
business perspective and, and as a vehicle to extend your ecosystem. So how do you define your business goals? How do you develop them as a product? And how do you take a life cycle view? Here are some examples that, uh, that what are the purposes that, uh, uh, that APIs have. For example, is your purpose to drive more innovation like uh, Kone is uh, using uh, their APIs to connect third parties like these service deliverers to deliver new experiences for their customers. Uh, and in this way, uh, create, create a better user experience. Or Apple uh, and Google also well known that they have their app store and through APIs, third parties can design applications and, and uh, make the platform uh, better by innovating on top of it. Or you can expand your platform's reach, like Uber. It's not necessary to go to Uber application because you can through API call a Uber button that in this case, for example, if you are in an in a, uh, application that where you book, uh, uh, where you book the uh, uh, table, you can basically then click on the Uber button and uh, uh, call on taxi. So it, this ex extends the reach of, of Uber platform. Or you can streamline processes like Kone is also having a, what we call a Kone service info API where the third party service companies can read the information from their system and provide services, service for the elevators and escalators. Or as an example, uh, other example, you have Flexport that has redesigned and, and developed and digitized uh, uh, freight forwarding platform where you can use it for uh, sea freight or, uh, or, or for uh, uh, flights. Uh, they, you don't expect that your customers will redesign their delivery systems, but they connect to Flexport system through API and greet the data. And in this way, Flexport can streamline the processes and help them to get real-time visibility into the, into the whole freight forwarding uh, ecosystem. Or you can monetize data. Uh, uh, that might be your business call. So you start with the data that you have, for example, the weather channel, uh, is monetizing their data through APIs. It has transformed a, a, a sort of the struggling media company into a hot platform that monetizes their data through APIs. Or Twitter that uh, also is monetizing their API. You can call uh, for seven days backwards, you can call uh, tweet, tweets through the API for free. And if you need more, then you pay for it. Then you have, uh, uh, when you think about uh, these APIs from the business perspective, you of course need a developer program to make them successful. It, it's not that you build them and they will come, but John Deere is an interesting company that I mentioned in the beginning. They have their own developer program similar to Apple developer program. They get every year developers together, they help them to develop on top of their APIs build better applications for farmers, improve the productivity. And they are measuring and managing these partners, maybe a little bit less than Apple has, but still significant number. And you need to have a consistency and communicating and, and make, making a long-term commitment because if somebody is building a business on top of your APIs, then uh, you need to make sure that you stick around and don't disappear next year. So uh, to bring these sort of the, uh, things uh, into together, we have here uh, seven steps that uh, one can use to build a, a, platform a platform business model, an intelligent platforms that I described was characterized by these three uh, traits, a network effect, AI powered learning loop and human intelligence to expand your platform capabilities uh, uh, into new areas. So if you think about uh, Amazon as an example, that how they started their journey, uh, they started from e-commerce, but rather than being afraid of, the, uh, of sticking into that, they were looking into the new areas and expanded into, into cloud business uh, and, and uh, 
help then other other companies to build on top of that. Then they expand it into uh, with this cloud into a, a new areas like AI and Alexa. Uh, and once everybody thought that the online business is only uh, happening online, they extended and bought uh, uh, this Whole Foods a bricks and mortar uh, grocery store and leveraged the platform, the loyalty program, logistics capabilities. So you have a pattern here. In a similar way, Tesla's turned fear of electric vehicles and self-driving into energy that they are driving into the new areas. They are removing friction, creating fans by being focused. Uh, learning faster than competition through these learning loops. Tesla hasn't yet opened their platform uh, through APIs, but they have started to take third parties, and I'm sure at some point of them will also open the APIs. And they have moved uh, beyond the car business into uh, energy uh, business through the home storage systems, and the whole company is kind of organized around AI. So. It's interesting how you see also very traditional businesses being overtaken by uh, platform business model. And in our new book, we are outlining some of these steps in more uh, detailed way. So I will stop here if there are any questions or comments uh, uh, in the end of this lecture, but uh, I was uh, happy to share some of my thoughts uh, around this uh, topic. And as you can see, uh, the being a platform is not the privilege of the big and mighty tech companies, but any company should think about its business through the platform business model and take advantage of the, some of these techniques. And the uh, uh, increases in connectivity, sensors, computing capabilities, and data is, is making that possible with cheaper and cheaper cost. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much, Terry. It's a fantastic talk and it covers a wide range of topics. And uh, also, I'm very impressed that you managed to put the thread through all different parts together by using AI to make it uh, link together. I think uh, for any companies, uh, they are not alone. They connect the technology, they connect the user, they connect the different parts and they need to optimize constantly. And all these things uh, with the help of the AI, I think is uh, making the more advantages and uh, all more viable for the company start to get involved uh, working on this kind of things. And uh, so taking a platform view, I think it should be vital for any companies viewing to going big and increase the competitivity in the world. So I think the talk now is open for discussions, comments, and questions. You can unmute yourself and uh, yeah, give your thoughts. Hi, Tero. Thanks very much for the talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, right, thank you. Thank you, I'm Michael Hilking from Huawei. Um, lot, lots of thoughts running through my mind. I should put my video on as well. Um, lot, lots of thoughts running through my mind um, on your talk. And um, one of them is around, well, yeah, how many industries, to use the word in the broadest possible sense, are not gonna benefit from some kind of platform approach. In other words, is, is there some area where platform might not be able to add value or does it apply to everywhere? And then there's all kinds of things reflecting around, well, yeah, um, whose data is it anyway? And is this part of the whole um, move, which is quite politically laden around moving away from ownership to um, just leasing everything in life? So two completely independent questions. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a both are very good, and one could say that uh, uh, my point of view is that uh, that platforms will touch almost every industry, but of course the pace is different because it started from the fully digital ones. That if you think about uh, the the services like uh, Facebook etc., et they are easier to platform 
platformized than, than some others. Uh, it moved into the marketplaces, first in the more in the B2C side, now also now B2B. But you think about that, you wouldn't think John Deere as a platform when you first look at it, but it definitely has the characteristics of the platform. So of course, when you move the physical world, there are some limitations that make the progress uh, slower, but with, with sensor capabilities, etc., we are seeing that uh, more and more data is coming online and also digital twins and things like that, where you model the physical world in the virtual will help to, to platformize these, these industries. Uh, also, I think uh, regulated industries like healthcare is, is more difficult. You have seen also in the banking side that uh, incumbents are actually quite slow to move. I'm sitting in uh, one of the incumbents bank boards and, and I can see it inside, but, but then you have a lot of newcomers that are challenging the, challenging the existing ways of doing business. So definitely banking is healthcare. I use example of the Zoom moving into that space, but in a, in a healthcare, there are a lot of limitations. And then the public sector in general, I be, believe that they would benefit uh, of, of platforms, but uh, sometimes you see that politically it's quite hard to move. Actually in Finland, one of the most advanced uh, appliers of AI is uh, tax department, the state tax department. So we have almost real-time taxation now in Finland, whether we like it or not, but, but anyway, that they, they really actually con collect all the data through APIs from, the, uh, from for example, salaries, uh, other information, uh, your, your ownerships, etc., and leverage tax based on that one. And it's all, all very real-time and you, you've seen a big improvement there in the last 10 years. And um, of course, I wish they would have started from healthcare to get us better treatment rather than more taxes, but that's a different thing. And the second one was your comment on the data. So we have seen that uh, uh, it's a good question, but if you look at, for example, B2B side, there's a lot of discussion who owns the data, but the main question is that can you use the data? What permissions do you have for it? Mm -hmm. And uh, very often, for example, we work with uh, a water utility uh, treatment uh, facility provider that uh, sells their equipment through uh, public water, typically a public water utility, water treatment facility operators. They didn't have the permission to, to use the sensor, the data from the sensors that they collected. So we need, they needed to negotiate that again. But once they got it, we built a a sort of the, an AI system that uh, predicts the water quality after the treatment and optimizes the chemical usage. So you have a, a lot of businesses where this uh, ownership or, or usage rights are not, not defined. And, and there, the first question is to try to understand what data do you need? Do you have the rights to use it? And for what purposes uh, to start to document your, your, your data assets, so to speak? And uh, of course, in the consumer side, Europe is not making it very easy. We had uh, uh, our book launch event where uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Bengt Holmström was speaking. He lives in the US, but his origin you know, is from Finland, a Finn. He was criticizing very heavily the European approach to, to personal data because it is uh, hindering progress. The, the purpose is good, but because Europe is applying the personal data legislation uh, uh, quite differently in different countries, then it causes a lot of difficulties for companies to implement that consistently. So not an easy question, but the first thing is to understand what data you have, what do you need it for, and what permissions do you have, and, and, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other? comments or questions um, um I, have, I actually have two questions sure um my first question is i understand as customers that when they first encounter with ai they will be very exciting because of the technology suite but as a consumer i believe most of them want a product that is fully developed 
instead of like halfway developed, like um, the Tesla cars. So how can you, um, how, how do you think that we as producers can maintain the customer's confidence while the AI is not fully developed? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. And it, it also applies both to the business and, and consumer side. But in a consumer side, of course, somehow being transparent about, uh, first of all, even the usage of AI that people understand that, that what, 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 are they, what are they using. Uh, there is a lot, of, lot to talk about uh, explainable AI uh, tools that you can use to uh, explain the AI decisions and behavior. Of course, a lot of these things that we might not even think that, or some people might not even think that uh, Tesla is self-driving car is uh, is uh, AI based because it just does some things and then next day it does some things better. But but the more we educate, uh, you know, if you think about the society at large, I think that we should have a basic understanding of AI for every citizen. And and Finland, we had this course that was developed by. University of Helsinki and one a private company, Elements of AI, it's trying to educate. It has been taken by hundreds of thousands of people uh, already, uh, and it's now also available in English. So it's that people understand the basics and, and what to expect because the AI is a kind of nonlinear system that develops gradually, as you said. So being more transparent about that. Also in the business, the business environment, uh, the question is that uh, if you have an expert that is have done these things that in a like paper factory and uh, uh, AI is predicting a failure, for example, through predicting maintenance, then uh, type of the system, then do they trust the prediction or not? And what do they do is, is a critical thing. Uh, and uh, by explaining and educating people, for example, uh, EON is, uh, is uh, ION is a, is a German utility company, energy utility. They went through a tremendous uh, large uh, educational uh, program throughout the company to educate their employees about the AI and its, its basic characteristics and capabilities to, to make the attitudes better and before they started to roll out AI in the various processes in the company. My second question is, um, there are lots of medias that are raising criticisms uh, towards the, the idea of the privacies. Um, because um, when we're using apps like Google's or when we're using product like Tesla's, as customers that we will be aware that there will be AI learning about our uh, behaviors and our data. Uh, like you mentioned before, more data equals to more or uh, less um, uh, less, less energy and quicker process of developing. But the, the, the question I want to ask is, how can customers sure, be sure that their data wouldn't be used for other purposes, but only to provide better services? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So no simple answer, but of course, regulatory environments is getting tighter that you, you cannot, uh, you, you, you need the permission and the data can be only used for a certain purpose and companies need to respect that. Of course, we have had examples where the boundaries have been crossed that the data was given for a certain purpose or a certain party and it was then uh, shared with another parties. But, uh, but uh, now, of course, the regu regulators are getting more strict and there is also this uh, uh, penalties that they are they are putting forward for companies that don't don't behave as they should. Uh, but I think that if you think about a company uh, values that uh, building a, for a long term and a robust company, you need to have a certain values and, and principles and data should definitely be part of the of that discussion that how do you treat personal data, what are your principles, etc. And by raising this discussion in the front, will help people to understand uh, uh, as an employee is what needs to be done and what cannot be done. But, uh, but there is no simple task because we see, you can basically, if I uh, use an application in my uh, phone, 
uh, I can see that they are sometimes asking permissions for things that I know that the application doesn't need. So why are they doing it? I think it starts from there. But there, there's, there's no simple sort of rule, but the, the more aware we are of these things and the more educated consumers are, the, the better I think the, the society will be at large. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pero, I have a, uh, just a link to questions. I think uh, you mentioned a very good point is uh, to get uh, people educated with the AI basic technology, because uh, currently AI being used as a word uh, like a magic, it will do everything you wanted and for the good. But is there anything that AI actually could not do, to, not to help? Or linked with that, with it, because it's a linear process, I saw some of the results, like Microsoft shows how to uh, clarify or categorize people's preference for image properties or the things. Some of the new input could destabilize the output result significantly. So the system could be intrinsically unstable in some cases. So how do you really make it work as you want it and on the incremental improvement or is it could it just adapt itself if you find on the wrong track and change it completely and which one will give the right output result? Yeah, the, the, we talk about a lot also about the AI and ethics where the, I recently read a book where, uh, where there was mentioned that the, they, they, they realized that they had the problem with the AI uh, when it actually was uh, it was image recognition software that it it characterized or it gave an output that the, the uh, person in the wheelchair was 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 labeled as a loser. So uh, they realized that this is now the huge problem that uh, mm -hmm. somehow the material that uh, they have used to train the AI was containing uh, labeling data that was labeled. Uh, incorrectly or, or not, not uh, fairly and ethically right. So I think one of the questions is about that, how do we remove bias and uh, injustice from the data that we use to train the AI and, and what principles are being used. And that, that, is, that is quite a, uh, it's a huge problem, but also a huge opportunity to do because the, biases that we have are of, of course coming from the humans that have been producing the data that is then used to train the AI. So in the best case the AI can correct uh, injustices that have been occurring for years because of the humans behaving unethically or, or, or unjust. So I think there's an opportunity but this requires more visibility and work and um, I think uh, AI ethics should be on the forefront and EU EU and also other regulators are looking into this, that what, what, how can we also bring new principles around this, this topic of AI ethics um, and make, make uh, sure that uh, AI systems are more robust and, and, and fair. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? If not, let's send speak again, Professor Terra or Jan Bergen. Thank you very much for this Thank you. Talk. Thank you for the opportunity and see you hopefully Thank you. soon. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for all participants.